39,255 men took their life in 2022. That number is up 2.3% since 2021. My goal with the After Dark series is to advocate for men's mental health by bringing on and talk about various topics that are off the taboo and men don't talk about. So we hope to do with this series is to role model conversations between men that are hard or difficult, including sharing stories about topics that I think are prevalent and need to be talked about, more about men is shared with transparency and honesty. And today I have one of my good friends coming all the way up from Tampa, Florida. That's right. My good friend, Vince Pit stick. He yes. is the owner of Nutrition Dynamic, Metabolic which is Mentor. now, which is now, which is now we rebranded with the okay. the full network. Now it's vital, vital, vital. V i d a l, right? Yep. Okay. Redefining nutrition. What Fair. are you feeding yourself mentally, physically, spiritually? I can't wait to see where this goes. Yeah, dude, yeah. he is so successful, gentlemen, uh, even ladies who might watch this podcast. I, I can't say enough good things about him. I've learned more from him than any of these functional books here uh in the last four years of getting to know him and have a friendship with him so actually it's been five uh funny story him and i and our buddy jason who's gonna be joining us in the syndicate uh scoop uh who you all know on the show uh we actually put together a seminar with us presenting because none of us, no one else would let us present anywhere else in the U.S. So we're like, I will do it ourselves. And I had a gym and we were just kind of a bunch of nobodies and we still are a bunch of nobodies, but we, uh, we had a good time, man. You know, we, we did a lot. We saw a lot of cities, met a lot of good, cool people, people who later came to work for us, friends, uh, family, but I've learned so much from him. But today we wanted to talk about addiction and uh, this is a topic that, you know, we've had Quentin on in the last episode where he shared the story about, you know, his son at uh, age 12 tragically taking his life with a firearm. Um, and, you know, to kind of shift gears and talk about something else, you know, a little edgy, I want to talk about addiction. And that's something that we see that's becoming huge in, in today's world, especially with the fentanyl crisis. Yeah everything else going on, but you know, there's all sorts of different addictions, right? Well, when you actually, when you stack up drugs, yeah, food, yep. um, even if you want to throw in codependency and relationships, oh, right. Um, yeah. Social media. When you, when you add all of them together, actually, usually it's in some variation degree, 60 to 70% of Americans will deal with some form of an emotional addiction, we'll call it, yeah. um, that, that can manifest in, in, into some people having, you know, obviously allergies to certain drugs, alcohol, you name it. So this is, this is, it's not, this conversation is really for America, but people will identify it by the people that use substances that then, you know, develop an allergy that then destroys their life. Cause it's way more obvious. It's way more visible and it's faster and it's way easier to pick out. That's why, you know, really right about the 19, 1900s is when you identified the first addict, which was the alcoholic, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. No. The, the addiction history is something that's like very, very important to me. And I think, I think to start this off, um, you know, for me, obviously, as a functional nutritionist, um, I've built a, a network that is eight, seven businesses now. That's, you know, well, 10 figures, right? <clears throat> but none of that. Congratulations on your success. So the reason I share that to the people is that, that my success comes from my addiction, my road with addiction, the ugliness, everything from it. You've got a boy that was severely uh, sick from the age of eight years old that gets into drugs and gangs and everything later in life to almost die multiple times to come out of that, to develop a process that's both for physical and mental healing that now heals thousands and thousands of people across the world. And eventually we plan on entirely impacting the way that uh, fitness and medicine operates based on the things that I have discovered in my battle with addiction. So that's the, just to give people a highlight. And it's, you know, sick boy, almost dies multiple times, battles with addiction to rise above, um, to now create an organization that's helping tens of thousands of people every year. I know, dude. Some of the stories I've seen, just, you know, I'm just like, damn. <laughs> you yeah. know, and I respect it as a personal trainer nutritionist because I know you weave some magic. Yeah. And um, yeah. I just know it's your commitment and just things I've learned. You know, yeah. like I tell everybody, I'm like, you know, I've been lucky in a couple areas. You and Jason, the nutrition yeah. area, Stephen Presby who helped me write my book yes. in regards to me and mentoring me over it. So yeah. I've been very lucky in that. Yeah. But I got to ask you a question because 
I call Vince V Daddy. <laughs> <My bad. laughs> I appreciate and you. And it's because he knows the UFC background. Most people don't know your how little yeah. MMA background in you and all that. Yes. Can you give me a little bit about how far you went with that? And I just want to know, I want to point yeah. this as a as a background because I gotta ask you. After yeah. you go into what you have to say, who is yeah. your favorite UFC fighter? Because I'm going with George St. Pierre. I just <sighs> like the technical aspect we of got, him to a degree. You're asking. It, it was just fun to watch. Right. Um oh, oh, on gosh. the spot, buddy now. I threw you the sideball. Ooh. Man, I had oh. the opportunity. Um, give me a second. So I think what Jewish St. Pierre stood for, probably, and being the type of champion that he was, you probably got to stick him there, number one. But the guy that really changed the sport was Conor McGregor. And uh, granted, <sighs> I know, listen, but he's a great I man. I don't disagree. Here, here's the issue. The new roadhouse is good. Here's the issue. Here's the issue. Conor McGregor, I think we can all agree, is a great man, but some would argue if he's a good man. So I'm not. I want a UFC. I want a UFC champion of someone that my children can model their life off of. That would not be Conor McGregor as much as I love that guy. I would not be Conor. Um, and so that's the challenging part when you think of a champion. What are, what are you evaluating? Because if it's just about the numbers and what they've done for the sport, well, you got to give it to Conor. Same thing for Michael Jordan. I don't know if I would have my child mirror their life off Michael Jordan either. I don't know if you could say Michael, I'm a huge Michael Jordan's fan. I don't know if you could say he's a good man. I'm just going to be honest. Like, I don't know if you can say that. I don't know. Maybe today. I don't know. But not, you know, not all great men are good. It's true. But good men can be great. Yeah, it's true. Right? And so that's the only reason I, that's why I say that. And I had the, I had the opportunity though, that my second sleeper, Rich Franklin. So, so my brother. Yeah, I'll go with that. Well, listen, here's why. I mean, he broke his hand. And still knocked out. Um, um, oh, why am I blanking right now? Uh, he knocked out the former uh, the Forrest McGregor. No, he, Forrest? yeah, no, no, no. no. Uh, so he broke his hand and he knocked out the legend Mohawk. Why am I blanking? I'm just at, I'm, I'm. We're just getting into Chuck started. Liddell? Chuck Liddell. But the reason here's why I love him. So my my brother was one of my friend, but brother not by blood. Me uh, and God rest his soul. Uh, Mojo Horn was his personal training partner um, and got him through all the championships, all the titles, all the things. And uh, he set up a private event, um, a place where he knew Rich was training and they set out time for me to privately spar. And Rich took the time to do that with me just not having much experience. That's cool. Rich was willing to bring me in and let me spar with him and let me be a little wild and clip him with stuff that I shouldn't be getting him with because I'm because I'm scared because <laughs> I'm scared. And and then even when I clipped him good, I clipped him good, and everyone was like, "Oh!" And Rich didn't. He went. He he wanted to teach me a lesson, but he had the grace of a champion, and he did it with body shots. I mean, he went to town with body shots. <laughs> I ended up having a fractured rib, um, but and I deserved that, and I wanted that. Right? I was I was not going to put a, take a knee. So like he did, he did me a service because he showed me a taste of what it would be really like at that level, but he, he let me down gently, you know what I mean? So, so that, the, it, the integrity of an individual in that moment tells me everything about that person. And then watching his championship reign, watch what he's done. I know he's with one FC and all, but he, he goes down as one of my favorite too. And, and, and now I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a big, like, I'm a big fan of, of, um, uh, uh, why am I blanking right now? Uh, he just won. Sean O'Malley. I like oh, Sean yeah. O'Malley. Yeah, I like yeah. Sean O'Malley. Yeah. Uh, you know, and He's and uh, Volkanovski. Volkanovski. I love everything that man stands for. Mm, yeah, you know I what I mean. Behind it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're getting rambling now, but I mean, I could go on forever. No, I know. I just like to show. Like it was just so funny because that was one thing I remember me and you were chatting about. Uh, oh, I and we were just I don't miss back any. and forth. I was just at you. I was just at UFC 298 Miami. Yeah. 299. Yeah. I got to I got to hang out with O'Malley for a little bit afterwards. Stop, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, Vince was cool life, man. Vince got some cool. What the Vince heck? cool down there. Well, yeah, there's now. some after party stuff. I, I know. I just I'm gonna come down there and like live with Vince for yeah. a week. Just like <laughs> That's I'll be tired. Vince be like, Jeff, you go to bed at seven. I'm like, I know. Uh, I'm getting old too, though. Yeah, man. I know. I, I like going to bed and getting up early. That's isn't what the, it nice? The, the success lives in that. Uh, well, I, my, my life, anyways. My life. The earlier I get up, the more successful I am. I'm not saying that it has to be for everybody. Okay. I just know that that really does work. 
Yeah. If you're looking to get more successful, retrain yourself to get to bed by nine, up by five, and I promise you, you'll be more productive. That's it's just a simple fact. It's for me the reason that I get up at three thirty, but that's because I have to be at the gym Ooh. at six. And you know, I first when I was twenty two, I was working for Homeland Security. I'd be at work at three three thirty in the morning. So I've always kind of like been on the schedule and just being a personal trainer in person. Six a.m. was the shift. But for me, it's I know that no one's awake, so I have peace. Yeah. And if you get up at five a.m., nobody's awake. You got time. And I always tell guys that I'm like, the best thing you could do is like Vince is saying, get some damn sleep. Mm. But uh, man, we could go about down this conversation. Yeah, I want to focus on you. That hour. I need that oh, hour yeah. before I feel like, I feel like I'm ahead of everyone. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm putting on the mindset of success. I do not wake up with it. No, I wake up. It's a habit you build. I, I wake up in the form of the trauma of a child. Like when I wake up, it's already immediately, it's like fear of scarcity and economic insecurity. And like, what do I not have done? What can go wrong? That's how I wake up. My, 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 when I wake up, it's on alert, it's on attack, it's on check boxes, it's on get things done. And while that sounds good, that's not the position that true leaders and champions, that's not the mindset. The mindset is to wake up and be solidified in your process and stoic in your approach and to not be swayed by emotional um, movement, like emotional pull, right. but driven by instinct, drive, and staying determined and, and disciplined. And so when I wake up, I have to put that on. I don't start with it. I have to go put it on like a pair of pants. And that requires me to do some things mentally, spiritually, physically, to put the exercises into place to flex that muscle and then be ready. It's like a warm up before the lift, right? Yeah. So I need that, I need that time because when I do that, I'm so dialed as a leader, as a mentor, right? As a, as a, as a coach, as a healer, um, all of those things. When I don't do that, the days are way more likely to sway out of my favor. And that is done by empirical evidence of many, many years now of doing this. And I don't want to do that at 9 a.m. I don't want to do that at 10 a.m. I don't want to do that at 11 a.m. Because the world's already operating around you. And now you're trying to catch up. And that's not the position that you want to be in. Agreed. You want to be ahead and in charge. Planned. Right? And that's why. So I, the more that I've dedicated myself to that, the more dialed I get. I'll tell you what, man, just abiding by the process keeps my anxiety so low. Right. Because worst case I know, if my day starts burning and falling apart, mm -hmm. tomorrow it's going to start up, start over the same exact way as it started that day. Yeah. So it's always good for managing. What was childhood like for you? Well, you said, la last thing I'll say in that no, is go for it. discipline is the truest form of freedom. I agree. Jocko made a good point in that book of his, Discipline yeah. Equals Freedom. Is that what he says? I've not yeah, read that book. Discipline Equals Freedom. He also I, wrote I've learned really that from one. addiction. Yeah. So I learned that from addiction. Yeah, so that's what we'll get into. The 12 steps showed me that. Yeah. That like when I... I don't, the only time I'm actually making a decision of free will is when I'm making one not according to my will. So my will would be the things that drive me, like my right. innate desires, eat that, sleep with that, snort that, do that. Those are all, those are all desires of self driven by dopamine, right? And when I stop and I don't do that thing and I go do the thing that I don't want to do that serves me and a, a purpose greater than me, that's freedom. And I'm certain of that, right? My life is living proof. But if I get woe is me and I start like consuming other people's opinions, Netflix, ho-hos, pornography, whatever it is, I'm way more likely to slide into the mundane, into the things that are more inside of me and myself. And then that's when I start experiencing more anxiety, more resentment, more doubt. And that's why I'm telling you, that's why that mental preparation in the morning for a guy like me, and if anyone's brain works like mine, which I think many people do, waking up in that nervousness and that anxiety, you need to put it on. You know, because that's where freedom is. And I want to start every day free. I agree, man. My day starts with a bike ride, as you know, and reading a book. That like, is. That's how it always that is. That's your freedom. I've been doing that for fuck, 15 years or some shit. Yeah. There's a book next to you over there. It's called Intoxication. This guy is a doctor. He wrote a really cool, compelling uh, book about one of our actual senses, like hearing and seeing is our innate ability to want to get screwed up. That like <laughs> dogs do it, cats do it. He makes these like amazing examples of like, I can see it because it's a lot easier to slide away. It's a lot easier to dodge the work. Yeah. It's a lot easier to yeah. sit down in life and just say, this is, I'm good here. Yeah. than it is to kind of keep going because yeah. keep going just is usually more painful yeah. no matter what. Yeah. Um, I want to get into pain. Yeah. You said that your childhood, you were sick. What was that like? Like paint your childhood up until the sickness, I guess. Like normal childhood, normal background, good parents, yeah. uh, everything like that. So grew up on a farm, oh, um, yeah. uh, solo, uh, uh, you know, a, um, on my own, right? As, a, as an you know, only child. 
Okay. Dad, major entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur of a farm business. Um, and I grew, drew up a, a dreamer because on the farm, we didn't, far, friends were really far apart. Right. Oh, yeah. we, I mean, you had to drive 10 minutes before you got to the next person. Right. Um, and so your mind grows when you have to, when you're your only friend and, uh, um, hardworking family. I learned a lot about that, but my father couldn't figure out how to be a great entrepreneur and a great dad at the same time. And that's really hard when you have a child young. And, uh, so there, you know, the fighting started between my, my mother and my father. Um, and I was a really high energy kid. Um, I wanted to spend my time out in the middle of the woods. I didn't want to go to class. And so it led to me, you know, first grade, I had challenges, right? Um, really smart in anything I wanted to put my mind to, but trying to get my attention was hard. And when my parents kind of separated in first grade, uh, I got held back in first grade. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought that made me stupider than the other kids. Um, and that's where a label, a narrative kind of got started that like, maybe I wasn't going to be enough, even though everybody thought I was going to be the heir apparent to this farm, like dynasty. Is that how your dad was grooming you? Yeah. 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 Okay. But then when things went sour between my mom and, and my dad, they had a really hard time. <clears throat> my dad had a hard time coming and getting me cause she moved away to Bloomington, normal Illinois, which is about two hours away. Okay. She had to start her life there and get back in school. And so I got shipped around. I stayed with my grandparents a lot. I stayed with my uncle and aunt because my dad was so busy and he was trying to figure out how to do this single dad stuff um, and still run this farm. And then also he became a police officer for extra money. So now he's, you've got all these different factors that are involved, right? And uh, I didn't understand it at the time. It just seemed like my dad just didn't, he was doing important things. And I wasn't that important, right? Um, and so- Damn, that hits. Yeah, 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 yeah. But my dad seemed really important. I'm sorry. This should be, I can't, I thought I turned it off all the way. I apologize. Oh, you're totally cool. I got mine on because I'm waiting for my books to be delivered. Which yeah, I'm just going to turn it off all the way. I apologize. Right, you're cool. So my dad seemed really important and was doing really important things. So I didn't look at it that way, but yeah, it was always me and my mom. Right. And then my mom had to leave and go start her life to try to figure it out. And uh, so she wanted to get in school and stuff. So now she's gone. Right. And now I'm kind of getting shipped around a lot. How old are you? Uh, six, six. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, right around six, uh, six through, through then through first grade. Usually kids start first grade and what? seven, eight. Yeah, like that. that. So yeah. then, so went from six, seven, eight, like into the first grade, right? <clears throat> so I was seven. It would have been seven for sure in the first grade. That's right. And then I got held back. So I was a little bit of an older first grader, right? Well, then I get shipped off finally. I, I moved with my mother to um, a bigger town. I'd never been to like a, it, even though it was a small town, it seemed like a big city. Yeah. Went to normal compared to Ottawa, Illinois, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, seemed like a big city. Uh, and, and, um, I grew up in a neighborhood, you know, um, and I had to learn neighborhood life. You can't, I wanted to go play everywhere. So I'm getting in trouble and, you know, in construction, I must've got brought home by the police at least 10 or 15 times <laughs> playing in construction housing. The, I remember doing that as a kid. You snuck on it at sundown oh, and yeah, yeah just do what you could. Cause I was used to just roaming. Right. Yeah. And there was, there was no roaming in a suburb, you know? So, uh, and, but anyway, so that, that starts that, but at, but then seven and a half, again, I get held back. I started having these really crazy, intensive, obsessive thoughts. I remember the first time that happened, my mom had just left from visiting and I'm walking outside and I'm walking on the sidewalk and I can remember it like it was yesterday at seven years old. I remember that I, that I stepped on a crack and then something, this voice popped in and goes, if you step on another crack, your mom's going to die. And I remember it was like spoken and it wasn't it didn't feel like my voice. It felt like someone else's voice, which is super weird. Cause usually everything I hear in your head is to the sound of your own voice, right? It's you talking to you, which is, can be relatively sinister because I don't believe every thought that you have is your own. And so it can be relatively sinister because it sounds like it's coming from someone you've known your whole life, but really where is that coming from? Right? And so I had this, this really strong, almost, it wasn't audible. I won't say that, but it was certainly loud. And it came in and it felt like it was coming in from left field. And it's like, you step on another crack, your mom's going to die. And I remember having that thought and I remember thinking how strange that was. And then that's when fear entered my life. That was the first day I'd ever feared anything. And uh, after that day, I started having more obsessions, more worries, trying to control things that I couldn't control. 
And I remember my family and everyone just looking at me like I was totally insane. They sent me to a bunch of different people to assess me. Most people thought it was just bad behavior. Everyone just kept telling me to stop. Turns out I have a very rare form of OCD at seven and a half years old, which is very rare for boys to get it that early. It almost never happens. And this was, this was you know, now 32 years ago. And so OCD awareness and, and mental and emotional disorder awareness was like piss poor. And the drugs they were using were archaic at that time. And they didn't know what they were doing. And so then began the journey uh, of me failing the medical system because they were, they, their, their options weren't working. Um, their solutions, their opinions weren't working. My parents just at the time at first, just kind of thinking, well, maybe there's, we just have a, maybe I just have a bad kid. You know what I mean? At least some people thought that. Um, they're just doing this. And um, sure enough, it ends up being a combination of, I'm fairly certain at this point, me being exposed to so many chemicals because I used to walk, to, I remember I told you I lived in cornfields. Um, I lived in, in, in chemicals. Yeah, I lived in everything. Functional books, <clears throat> man. And they make yeah. it. Go, and I was also going through and experiencing um, um, rejection from my mom in my, in my mind, right? She left. They're separated. Things are weird. Um, I go live with my mom. My mom gets in immediately in toxic relationships that are very disgruntled and semi-violent. I love my mom today, but she was addicted to toxic relationships, codependent relationships. She had her own addictions. And she had definitely had OCD too. So I know that today. So my mom was an amazing person. She just struggled with what she struggled with, right? But I had to witness it and I became her husband at a very young age. You know, I was, I was, right. the, yeah. I was the eight and a half year old husband. Like, yeah. why, where are you at? Why are you not home? What are you doing? Why are you with this guy? Not that yep. she was running around. She wasn't that kind of lady. She wasn't like no, running yeah, around no. at the bars and nothing like that. It sounds like the mom was similar, but just different ways. Yeah, yeah. but but once she got locked in on you, she was like obsessed with making it work. Bulldog, we'll yeah. let you go, man. Yeah. That's how my mom yeah. was. She Grab loved hard like that. Italian mom, she loved hard. I right? had Irish mom, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So so like, um, and, and you know, that that was like my first, you know, and really experience of intimacy in a way because me and my mom shared more of a, not an apparent relationship it was more like a husband wife relationship not anything weird she didn't do like i'm not saying that yeah no i know like i don't want anybody to get the wrong impression about what no, i'm saying i know what you mean because when my dad moved out to california and when i broke my leg we couldn't move i talk about it in my book i, I just remember over time my mom would start having conversations with me yes that i was like huh yeah you're you know the one that's there. yeah it, exactly and it was just because she had no one else to talk to yeah. herself and and i can look back on that and be like yeah, she just had no one to talk to. You know, you go to a council, they say, well, that was inappropriate. It's like, well, I mean, what was Donna supposed to do? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, yeah. I have to forgive it, but I know what you mean because that relationship exposed me in certain ways to how relationships were with women, and I was terrible at them for a long time. Yes, right. Probably so, still am. Right. <laughs> it does shape yeah. the view of relationships, but – what I'll say is this, is that, so going through that now, my, uh, delusional OCD got really bad. Um, I thought everyone around me was aliens. I was touching walls, washing my hands, had to sleep a certain way in the bed. It was crippled me. Strap you to your bed. Kind of Do you remember OCD. anything that instigated the spiral? Uh, what I can tell you is again, it, the first trigger was, you know, my mom like leaving, to go start a new yeah. life somewhere else. I mean, like when you, when you were like, how did you rationalize you needed to sleep on this in a certain same way in the bed? The thoughts would just come, they would come and go. So okay. I would, I had the fear of thinking for a very long time. So we wouldn't let me watch TV because if I got an idea, so at, let me, let me, let me, the thing that trips will trip me out is that today we're arguing the things that I thought of and debated when I was eight years old. And the first one was augmented reality. And, and do we live in a simulation? I've always wondered that. So do we, I was worried about that at eight. I wasn't worried about that then, but okay. yeah, no. I, I was worried about aliens at eight. I was still eight. in Dungeons and Dragons. This is what I'm telling you. Yeah. I, had to, I grew up fast. And then my life was a lot like Inception. So I would, go into movie too. I would go into realities and I couldn't get out of them. And I would have to stay there and build my own world because I was a dreamer and I was a, I was a only child. So I would dream, I would dream my own worlds many times over uh, there at that farmhouse. And then with my mother, You're a good entrepreneur, right? Engineering. It gets there. This is all mental training. God's right. preparing me. Okay. So yeah. I want, I, I, I don't want any pity, 
right? God's preparing me to be the, like the, the amazing guy I think I am today. I think I've earned that, you know, not in an arrogance, but just the work that I've Point. done. Yeah. He's preparing me to be a guy of, of, of exception. And then it's my choice what to do with it. Mm-hmm. But I don't know this at the time. This all, this all feels like, why the hell is this happening to me? Okay. Right. And it, and it feels very, very one-sided and it feels like everyone's living life with impunity and I'm having to observe it from a bubble. Right. Okay. And, uh, and so <clears throat> we would go to different doctors. And I remember one time, this one psychiatrist is like, you got to get these kids on the, you got to put them on meds. You got to put them on meds. And we're sitting in the doctor's office. Um, and I'm looking over at this kid and I can remember this one time there's this kid sitting across from me and he's drooling from like whatever meds this doctor's got on him. And I see all the kids and most of them are on medications and I'm looking at them and I'm thinking to myself, I understand that I've got problems where I am, but I don't know where they are. And I don't know if I can come back from that. Right. So I don't want to be there. And I remember running out of that doctor's office and my mom having to catch up to me and me crying and saying, mom, I don't want to take these pills. And she says, son, you don't have to. And, uh, that was one of the most, the most genius things my mom ever did. She trusted her instinct. And, uh, she said, son, you don't have to, if you don't want to. And my mom was my champion. Cause once my mom figured out something was wrong, she had my back and went to the ends of the earth to try to help me figure out what was wrong. Yeah, no. So that's interesting. You say that cause God, I swear it's like our moms are similar. I say in my book, one of the greatest things my mom ever did for me was not allowing me to take pain pills. Once I left the hospital, yeah. knowing yeah. what we see now yeah. and knowing what you see now with the pills, yeah. because today Donna would be looked at as a cold hearted bitch yeah. for doing that. Well, she might have son's be, in uh, pain, give him yeah. pills. And, and I get it, but she was like, the, Cause she understood it for whatever reason. And she's like, this is, she was very hard on me in the sense of this could be forever. So you got to learn how to manage it. People aren't going to manage it f- against you. You have to manage against them. And it was like, well, all right. So I just learned how to deal with how to toughen it up. Yeah. So it sounded like she just kind of was like, you get to make a choice. But Donna was like that to me too, yeah. but she let me know her opinion yeah. very much. So. Yeah. My, my, my mom had, a protective like instinct. And I think yeah. she used it and said, no, if my son says no, then I say no. And I, I really respect that. But then she was going to make me work through it. Yeah. And my mom, my mom, my mom after that too, I mean, she ended up becoming like a, a major buyer in the automotive field. She broke a lot of ground as a female in an, in an all um, male dominated industry. Yeah, she broke ground cool. and became one of the largest female buyers that existed in the automotive industry at Mitsubishi Motors, even during the time when Sounds Mitsubishi- like I need to have her on the podcast. Like we need to have her yeah, on the she's, syndicate. Uh, she's a very, that. I, that's why I serenaded her at the first hybrid health summit. Oh, even cool. though all the stuff, like we got more stuff. I mean, she, she's not, you know, she's a good woman and a great woman, but she had flaws, right? right. We all did growing up. Right. And she was growing up too. kids having kids then too, more than ever. You know, she was young when she had me, he was like 22 or something like that. Um, which is not young at the time. I understand that, but still, um, so, so the, I think the, the, the part then is that I had to, I saw more counselors than anybody I've ever met. Uh, Um, yeah. And I got, I got really good at counseling them. I got really good with manipulating them. Yeah. I got really good at convincing you I was telling you something, but you know nothing, right? And thinking you, we made ground, but I'm not, we're not making any ground. I've just got to keep you at arm's distance. And um, I suffered like that for a very, very long time. Uh, we, we went on for a few more years. Um, I think we're sitting at, uh, at this point, and I'm, you know, I'm hiding it from everyone else. But I went through a phase where um, I accidentally saw uh, Stephen King's The Last Stand, yeah, so the, when it was on CBS, the CBS special, like 93. Yeah. yeah. yeah and then that. also Lawnmower Man. I don't know if you remember that one. Uh, kind of vague. Lawnmower Man that. is where there was a first augmented reality. It was a vir- virtual reality. We got put in this machine that took you into virtual reality and he couldn't distinguish the difference between what was real and what wasn't. And oh, yeah. Okay. I that, that, that shut my life down for a year.
It is here, Riddle 2 Unbreakable. It ships this month, ladies and gentlemen. It is, as I say, an autobiography that cannot resist being a self-help book. Uh, if you're looking for something that I would say is a raw therapy session, a chance to really see an honest look into someone's life and seeing that it's not always pretty, that sometimes the ugliness makes us who we really are. This is something I want to share with you guys, my story. So please check me out, brutal to unbreakable.com. You guys pre-order shipping in April. It is actually hand autographed by me, my beautiful signature. Voila. Who would have thought a guy with a brittle bone disease who didn't amount to much in the bodybuilding world as a sponsored athlete with a supplement company? Me either. But New Ethics Formulations, man, they took a chance on me, my gym, and my clients. And all I ask for you all is they sponsor my show. They sponsor this segment, the After Dark segment, for you men and mental health. You guys taking athletic greens? You guys taking things like that? All I ask you to do is try their gourmet greens. Just try it once. Give them a fair chance. Try it one time. If you guys don't like it, well, talk to me. I'll buy it from you. Discount code RELENTLESS10. Support those who support me who are supporting other men. Guys, have you been looking to see what's going on underneath the hood lately? Yeah, I know, right? You don't go doctors. They don't listen to you. You're like, doc, I feel like crap. I feel like shit. I'm slow. Yeah, your testosterone level's fine. What if I told you it's probably not? You're seeing more men today with low T than ever. Even women, too. So, guys, I partner with a group that I believe in, Advanced Vitality. They'll offer you $25 off your first initial labs to get a look underneath the hood. And guess what? If you don't need anything, you know what they're going to do? They're going to recommend a great diet, exercise, a supplement program to help you really get to that phase to remember them for a time that you might need them. But if you do need them, they're the ones that I recommend and I send my clients to. So check them out. Go to brittle2unbreakable.com. Underneath sponsors, AVH. That's the way to get the discount and go see what's going on underneath that hood, ladies and gentlemen. Well, most of the guys. Hi, guys. I'm functional health coach uh, Vince Pitstick, founder of the Vital Network uh, and founder of the University Metabolic Mentor University. Uh, if you are any type of practitioner, personal trainer, nutritionist, and you are looking for more tools to radically change the lives of your clients or your patients, we have a nutritional system that we teach at our university. Uh, <clears throat> we'll cut that. We have a nutritional system that we teach at our university that could rapidly build your business, change lives. And uh, so come check us out, Metabolic Mentor University uh, on Instagram or uh, MMU or uh, MetabolicMentor.com. Check us out there. And if you just want to see some of my other content, um, go to Instagram, Vince underscore Pitstick, um, or go to Vital underscore Coaching.com. Yeah, I lost an entire year to my life to watch in one movie. So Damn. it was, yeah. Right. So it would take me into another prison of thought that then I would have to logically work my way out of until I found an answer that was comfortable enough that I could surrender it. Right. And that that gridlock, like being like I said, go back to if you've seen um, and now I'm blanking right now. But if you've seen um, no, uh, <laughs> I'm going about, all these we're going all over the place. Over the rings. <laughs> uh, no, the with Leonardo DiCaprio, it was uh, Inception. Inception. I'm sorry, I was traveling a lot today. Yeah, we're, but I get trapped in a world, and I would I would have to solve the reasoning for why it wasn't real, so I could go back to the world that I was in physically. That's interesting, man. I, I've never heard heard this before, yeah. but I can understand it completely because I I've, I I related to when you said earlier talked about like when you were alone you created worlds because I remember I was trapped in my body cast by myself hours on end just having to go places yeah. like think yeah. so I could relate a lot to that I just never ever got stuck there I don't know I think it's because we maybe probably had this is where trauma affects us yeah. all differently yeah. I think what I suffer from is it because of it I don't attach to anything yeah. because it just will annoy me unless I really want to be a, a, into it. Yeah. And I, I have almost like a, ugh. Yeah. so I won't, I'll, I'll peak and I'm like, not for me. And I'll go out and I could detach, yeah. but that also shows up in bad air, yeah, bad ways. Sure, and other certainly. Ways and, and mine yeah. was like, hang on for, for to everything You're for too alive. long. Yeah. 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 So S how did you work your way out of this prison yeah. and how did you start evolving and so, kind of get teenage years on up into early adult? So as boys, so the problem is now during this whole time, what I'm not telling my counselors is that the violence is on 20, uh, volume 27 at the house every night oh, screaming the, the, the guy she'd been with for like 10 years. Okay. And, and there were many nights where I would, my mom would watch his house 
I hope my mom doesn't see this podcast. But I'm, I'm sharing some things that I've never shared before. But it, I think it's for the I good of everyone that else. Transparency. I think, I think it's good for everyone else. Mom, I love you. You're amazing. No, but, other men but have she this. Just, like I had stuff with my mom that sometimes like, holy hell. We would, we would, she would watch outside their houses and I would sit in the back of the car and try to get my homework done for school. And we'd stay there overnight. And many times the police came up on us and like, it was just, it was insane. It was a little unmanageable. Okay. Let's put it that way. And, and there was no physical talk, violence towards me. And I always had things like I always had a roof over my head. Right. Right. And then, then my father comes back in the picture and I mean, we have disagreements, but he tried to take my mom to court over it and then get me another counselor. So here's where it gets tricky. Now you got his counselor, but what his counselor is doing is pining for evidence to then use in court against my mom to get the child support down. So now I can't, I don't know what the, so I don't know you for the money. So, is now, how you now my dad was, yeah, uh, we could argue, he argues he was really trying to legitimately get me, but I, I don't think it, where he was at the time, he really wanted me to be at his, be with him, okay? He wasn't at that maturity at that time, okay? But now I don't know, now it's like, okay, what is the counselor's motives, right? So now I'm thinking, I'm playing chess here, like, what story do I need to keep you, keep, keep to, what story do I need to give you to keep you off the trail, but give you just enough that you think I'm giving you something, but not enough that I convict anybody of anything. Do you see what happens? Yeah. So now it gets real weird and I'm going through this super weird time and I'm, they're going, they're throwing me, I'm at, I'm at counselors at my mom's counselors at my dad's and I, I'm going through this. So now I don't trust anybody. Now I'm fairly certain because my mom is a really, she has OCD. So she does weird things as a human being. So then I go through the last weird period of eight months where I'm fairly certain I've been carted to a, an alien world. I'm certain that most people here are aliens and that I'm being observed. I thought about this at nine. What comes later? Truman Show, right? Remember Truman Show? So I'm thinking I'm being observed. And the reason I believe this is because my mother, if she's a human being, she wouldn't do things that human beings don't do if you're a human being. Like you don't walk through doors twice, you don't sit outside people's houses, you don't do a lot of these things. So as I'm watching my mom, who's supposed to be the closest thing in my world, and I'm starting to note that like, all right, simple, you know, nine-year-old logic, or I'm 10 at this point, but if you're, okay, human beings don't do the things that you're doing, so then you can't be a human being, and if you're not a human being, then you're an alien, right? And you're, and okay, so if you're an alien- I'm still following the logic at that. Right, so if you're an still, alien and yeah. you're telling me that there's something wrong with me, that means there probably isn't something wrong with me and you're recognizing that I'm awake and you're trying to suppress it in me. I'm the ones that can see you guys through all the things that I've been through. So then the counselor's trying to get me to fall asleep too. Everyone's trying to make me go to sleep. And that's not totally wrong in society. Think about CNN. Think of, think of uh, you know, tr our trusted um, institutions. Think of the government. There are lots of people trying to make you go to sleep, right? It's real. That's not an, so again, all of these things play a part later. And, and, but I'm coming at it from a, a place of aliens and all these other stuff, which I still contend for you. I'm sure aliens are real. I just don't believe I'm on I an still alien. I believe that too. Right, man. I, mean, I don't and, care. Call me weird. Well, we can have another conversation. Know, What's dude. not on there? Well, yeah, we have I'll a just, real conversation yeah, about that. I just drop some drugs. Yeah, right. <laughs> but <laughs> listen, the the point of the matter is, is that I finally went to a counselor that he got that he knew what I was doing. This guy, this guy had, this guy really knew what he was doing. He knew I was on bullshit. He knew he wasn't going to get to me. So he played the long game. I went to this counselor. Uh, and all we did was play chess for three months. Didn't I, he didn't ask me anything about my days. He didn't do nothing. He just played chess. He started working co cognitive behavioral therapy with me, which is incredible, by the way. Yeah, I've been through it. Um, cognitive behavioral challenges you to split yourself in two fundamentally and, and watch yourself and your reactions as if you're an observer on this planet watching you react, and then you two have a conversation about the observation. And he would trigger me with certain things. But then what he did was, man, he played chess with me for so long that he finally set me up. He set me with a trigger and then he's like, hey, let's play chess. And he put me into a hard game of chess and I got done and I beat him. And at the end of the game, he looked at me and goes, Vince, you have a choice. You can either choose the narrative that you are a sick boy, right? 
or you can choose the narrative that you're a healed, healthy boy that can move on with his life. Because just in this moment, you played this entire game and you just beat me. And then not one moment in that game did you ever have a, a thought that you acted on or anything. You were entirely in control. What I've just shown you over these three months is that you are in control of your destiny. You control this and you have to make a choice. You're either going to go on. You're not going to believe me. I'm the alien, right? So you're either going to go on to the bitter ends, continuing to believe that, or at some point you just got to trust me and you got to believe that you, you, right, are a healthy boy that can do anything that he wants to do. And when he challenged, it was in that moment, it was like a decision. And I know that for some people, they may not, they've had this moment. I walked out of there and my OCD for the most part was gone. And I don't mean gone in the, in the terms that like, I don't have the obsessive thoughts. It shows back up later in my drug addiction, but I know I walked out of there and I no longer touched walls, washed hands. I let go. And I said, I'm just going to choose to be Vince that's on planet earth no aliens, no nothing. Even if there is, I just want to be happy. Even if this is an alternate universe, I just want to be happy. Fuck it. If everyone's an alien and I'm having a good time, fuck it. You know, if, if this is an alternate reality and, and, and I'm not really in real life, if I'm happy, hell with it. I'm going to choose to be a healthy young man and go out and do whatever I want to do. And that was it. And one of the things you also learn in the science uh, at about like males, 14, 15, 16, you start dropping testosterone, start developing. And for some reason, boys grow out of OCD easier than girls because estrogen, progesterone, female dominated hormones can make those things worse. But in men, androgens usually make it better. And so I think I was helped by that, but also those moments, but that was also at the exact same time, 14 years old is when I really start finding the gym. 14 years old is when I start cleaning up my diet, not for good purposes. I just wanted to be wanted by women, right? And I knew girls were pointing out my abs, but I started cleaning these things up in my life. There's no, I have no doubt that today, the mixture of cleaning up my diet, getting to the gym, doing hard things, seeing the therapist all together is what lifted the obsessions from me. Yeah. So now do the math about functional medicine today and what I do today. I'm putting all those things together yeah. in one program. No, I'm just like processing this. Like just the power that you just kind of like, yeah, I don't know, man. With, with the counselor, I had one who was much to the detriment of my probably last relationship um, I was in because he was kind of like, are you always going to listen to the narrative that your partner is going to write about you? If, if it brings you unhappiness and it was just one of those moments where I was like, wow, you really challenged me in here. Cause you know, normally they go along and they want to do all this shit yeah. and you finally had someone who like, who made you think something you already kind of maybe knew, but didn't know how to maybe sort and turnkey it to walk through the door. Yeah, it was one of those, he proved it to you. And he snuck it in there because he knew I would resist it. Yeah, because that's if, if how he it thought was. Of, if, he, he, if, I was, if he thought I was working in, he thought he, if, if he thought I thought, or if I thought he was working an angle, I would have immediately shut it down and tried to trump him. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. he knew it. Yeah, I remember when I went to mine, it was, I was in there and I told him before, but it, I was like, in order for this to work, I got to know something, man. Yeah. And I was like, I've been around this. And he told me, you know, he was like a, uh, you know, retired alcoholic and, you know, burned his life down, got a second chance. And he just wanted to help a lot of men. He only dealt, he only deals with men. And I think I did really well with that. I think I got lucky stumbling on him, but that goes to the importance that I think all men need to hear. Therapy is a huge thing. And it's really evolved because I relate to where you were as a kid. I had stuff going on. I wanted to kill myself at 11 because of the pain I was going through. I didn't want to live. So, but that wasn't really around then, you know, 91, 92, you're going really mental health didn't jump on the scene until 2010, 2011. It kind of started building up a little bit more. Oh, this is bigger. I think it came from the fallout of the wars yeah. um, that our generation saw. There was a lot of, okay, there's stuff here. And then, okay, wow, there's stuff over here. And, there's really this thing that the human body, like the body keeps score that you, you know, we talk about, all these different things. But you get after past all that. 
So OCD, yes. obsessive compulsive behavior, needs to come with a warning label. Don't do drugs. Okay, yeah. So, but that's what I wanted to ask. So, when you get to when you get done and your testosterone is dropping, and you're talking about the fun, you're talking about the function, what you do now. Yeah. Where were you setting up for? Like, so, like you're a 16, 18 at this time? No, I'm 14. Okay, right, 14. Four, it's 14. Now, remember, there's still a lot of violence going on in the home. Okay, my mother leaves again, so she runs out again, and she leaves me with the stepdad. Okay. Wow. Um, she, at the time, she thought it'd be better to keep me at the school I was at to finish up because I was like coming into my senior year because I was fit to come in 15. Did you and the stepdad get along? Huh? Did you and the stepdad get along? Um, at times, but it was getting more tumultuous because I was becoming more rebellious. Right. Right. Because I'm no longer the um, perfect kid that got all good grades in school, husband to my mom. I'm now growing and I'm. I'm, 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 events. yeah, yeah. And I, and I, and I become aware that my parents are, um, I, well, that's at a very early age that my parents were just a, adults that were making mistakes like everyone else. In fact, children in their own right. And, um, I needed to find my own way because I don't think they have the way for me. And uh, I felt like my father didn't really care. And so that's when I, that's when I started running with a lot of people I was sneaking out every night. And I started running with a group of kids that, um, I felt like it was my family because they would sneak out and they wanted me there. And that's when I started getting introduced to, you know, alcohol, drugs, all that. And that's the, what you're saying, the OCD. And, and the OCD. The and the minute drugs. that I would do, like when I would get a little drunk or when I would, uh, you know, I remember the first time like I did cocaine, but that was like 16. There was no thoughts. It was all like, I can do anything that I want to do. Driven, right? It was this moment of clarity where I like felt like, in the zone, in control, and I felt powerful, right? And I go, oh, so this is the solution, right? This is what, this is my escape. Because I'm still having the thoughts and the insecurities and a lot of that, although I'm growing into myself now, though. At 14, I was a very unpopular kind of kid in the background because I had all that stuff going on in my head. And when I started coming out of that, I, that's when I started developing a lot faster. And all of a sudden, I started to be actually looked at by girls, Right. This is so, so, so now this is a new thing because I was the dork bullhead, like, you know, right. like I was not, um, uh, and I remember, um, so, you know, getting into, into high school and now I'm starting to develop and, uh, and so I start really trying to do the popular thing and all the stuff and hang out with the kids that would, that would be, you know, doing drugs or I was trying to be cool cause I wanted everyone to like me. Right. I had a deep I desire. I remember going home some nights just being like, God, I just want everyone to like me. <laughs> right. So badly. Right. Didn't want to be not well, liked. normal as a kid. You right. But I want, that. but again, I wanted it in such a way that I was willing to put up with people bullying me and oh, doing different things shit. and put myself yeah. around people that I knew I didn't need to be around. And <clears throat> because I, I wanted it so bad. Right. And, uh, that was an unhealthy form of that. Right. You know, uh, that I had to learn later, but um, but that's when the, that's when the drug, that's when the drugs start. And then that's when running with, you know, um, criminals. And so I end up at this point now running with a group of people that were in different gangs and we kind of made a friendship and my, you know, my mom was kind of doing her thing. My stepdad didn't know. And so now I'm, I'm gone all the time. My, I don't even know how I graduated my senior year. I was able to convince my, I was able to convince my journalist teacher to write me a, cause we were friends to write me like a letter that got me into Eastern Illinois with like a partial scholarship or something for journalism. And it would at least would reduced, um, um, cost. cost. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, but I shouldn't have made it out of senior year. I definitely should have made it out of senior year, you know? Um, and now I'm starting to sell drugs, right? Because that's what the cool kids do, right? And um, early entrepreneurial energy, just misplaced, right? Right? And uh, <clears throat> yeah, and um, and but that's when uh, the criminal behavior starts. I mean, I was running with a group of people that was <clears throat> stealing from cars, homes, houses almost every night. You know, as a group of people hitting up different neighborhoods, bringing stuff back, selling it for the group. And we could use the money to throw parties and get food for the apartment that we were staying at and like all that kind of stuff. And 
Um, I did that for like hardcore for almost a year and a half, so much so that a task force was developed to find us. And that's when God stepped in again. Cause one day I woke up, uh, I had actually, and we'll talk it on here. I'd stole, uh, I don't know how far back this can go. Cause this was a, I might want to be careful. Let's just say, I don't know how far yes, back, can lie. I don't know how far back we can go, but let's just say I was, I had stolen, um, you say you did something weapons. that you had like crossed the line on that yeah. you felt. I'd stolen weapons Fuck. that I should not have stolen. Fuck. And and I brought them and those weapons started being used as threats against other groups. And I woke up one day and I was like, it was like this moment from God. It's like, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to be in this situation. And I went and stole those back from the group that I was with and they ended up gang jumping me it was a really bad deal uh, one of those that you get beat so bad you just pissed on yourself i just like the whole like you know the whole thing right uh i've got an in- insane story about that if you really want to get it on the on the on the recovery thing because the guy that leads it at that time later on two years later is the guy that gets me off cocaine and saves my life but the guy that sets up the group of like gd folks and other people that jump me at this time uh, who was supposed to be my friend. He thought I wanted to sleep with his girlfriend. Actually, she was trying to sleep with me and I never did any of that stuff. But if you get toxic, they end up jumping me. I get out of the group. I'm saying all of you are about to go to jail because of how you're running in, into these houses and doing these things. Two days later, they get caught. The new guy they entered into the group was trying to steal like Schwan patties from like a house. And anyways, long story short, the c- cops come in, everybody comes in, everyone goes to jail. I'm the only one that just stays out of it, doesn't talk to the police, doesn't do anything. Long story short, everybody goes to jail, but I got out. You know, I was out, fortunately. And um, uh, and uh, he went to jail and realized that was the, my good friend, Andy, uh, went to jail. And he realized later on that um, I was the only one not to talk. And I moved. And so he called me for a year from prison, just so, like, apologetic and sorry that he had the one person that wasn't Judas was the one that he jumped. And he gets so he comes in and out of jail and I try to help him a lot, but he gets sober in prison. Meanwhile, I get really bad on my cocaine addiction, really bad traveling, traveling with these, uh, entertainment groups. It's a, that's a story I've traveled internationally. And so I was getting, let's talk about that because um, you were a male exotic dancer back in the day. I have not talked about this. I know, but I, I I feel like this is like, this is the podcast for this. this? uh, dude, we've we uh, after, after Quinn's and Danny's, it's up to you. But I think what it does for me is that the reason I bring that up right now yeah. is I think it paints the picture of just how gone and alone you were. Like, you know what I mean? Like, Ooh, you're going is this down. The podcast I want to drop that on. It's up to you. I'll respect I've never you either way. Talked about that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's get I into it. I appreciate you, brother. All right. Uh, so yes. So. Um, anyway, so I go to college, all right, go to college. I get out of all that crime, go to college. Um, and, uh, but it's called a geographical because you can't change you wherever you go. There you are. So I'm thinking I got by, (laughs) I got out of all that. Thank God. Um, go to college, join Sigma Chi. So I joined a fraternity at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, going to school and, uh, that's when cocaine really kind of took over, you know? And I remember the first time that, <clears throat> I remember the first time that I was doing cocaine, um, and we had gotten involved with like really bad people with it. But I remember I'm at this party where there's like kilos of cocaine and I remember doing like a huge, like gram line, like, and it hit me so hard. And that was the moment I, it, I could definitely got addicted. I remember that because it felt so good. And I'm just like staring at the carpet and I'm just like, this is the most amazing feeling. Damn, yeah. No, I, I, I used cocaine back then. Ever. And, uh, this is not a, uh, advocation for, for, for drug use, but, uh, oh, that kind of for cocaine so for me, addicting. for me. Uh, you know, for, for, for me, I'm, plenty of people can use drugs and drugs are not morally, and that's not my, that's not my thing. But for me, right. It was, it was, it was a problem because I ended up having an allergy to it. Right. Um, and what? No, no, good. Sorry. I said, oh no, because you were allergic to it. Oh yeah. Well, think of it. We call it, we think of it like an allergy. 
So, um, after that point, now all of my decisions were about like having parties, throwing parties. I was really good at that. Right. Um, and having everyone have a good time and it was not about school. And, you know, I started out with like a 1.9 GPA. I ended up getting thrown out of the fraternity, I ended up getting thrown out of the, basically thrown out of the school. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, that was when, uh, at that moment and the girl that I really loved at the time left me over my drug use and, um, we got involved with really, really some, my, some of the people in the, in the fraternity that I was in got involved with other biker gangs, uh, and people that I sh just not, shouldn't have been involved with in the game that it, I was right. And, uh, and so that was when, um, again, my girlfriend at the time leaves and that broke me. And then one of my old friends came to me and said, Hey, there's an opportunity. Like, um, I'm a part of this like male entertainment group called the men of Playgirl. And, uh, if you want to come try out, like they'll take you on tour and you can make a lot of money and you know, this whole thing. And so I was like, oh, all right, give it a try. And what, what I got going right now? And, uh, they, I got, got the job and I started learning about like stage entertainment, like, like, um, and, um, long story short, I started doing that for a while. Right now, now, uh, this is something I've actually never discussed on, on, uh, social media or anything like that, but that's where a lot of my hardcore nutrition started coming from being on the road, being the nutritionist for a lot of guys, um, studying nutrition because now I wanted to be the best. I wanted to look the best. I wanted to have the best body on stage. I wanted to be the best performer. And that started my obsession with that. Right. And this is when I'm really heavy in the gym. Um, this is when I really got heavy in the gym. V daddy used to be bigger back in the day. A lot bigger. Right now, the gym had always somewhat been important to me because back in sports, I did play sports, you know, um, I did play sports. So, uh, the gym was always important to me, uh, especially getting out of the sports, right. but it became really, it became life and I got really good at it. So the gym was the first thing, like when I talk about addiction recovery, the 12 steps and everything else doesn't come later. The first thing that helped me was the gym. Right. It was the one thing that I was good at, it felt like. And then that's when I had found entertainment. So then, long story short, I ended up working with a, um, a, a traveling group of, of, men, of men of play or uh, Chippendales. And I toured the country and I toured other international locations. And I did that for a very, very long time. Got to management for a while. Um, and uh, I, tr you know, met a lot of celebrities, did a lot of big events. Um, you know, and, uh, but again, all I'm doing now I'm doing more drugs, more alcohol, women yeah. every night, every night, that rock star lifestyle that I was running from, you know, I was just running towards pleasure, not things that made me happy. But during that time, I'm also going, I start going back to school. So I'm like in school, I'm like studying nutrition. I'm traveling on the road and I'm still battling this drug addiction. It's funny how you you certain spots to yourself straight like yeah i remember wanting to kill myself and heavily no one could have thought that about me but i was fine at work because i showed up perform because the area i wanted to be yeah. performing but then stop the stain per se that i had over here yeah yeah so now you're now here it is like i quit school but it's hard to say no to this money because i'll do shows for three thousand people you know what i mean yeah. Right, like, like no, they put they pack out. Like I remember Knoxville caught Night Joe's, <laughs> yeah, up there, dude. They pack it out. Like it would yeah. sell out up there, twenty five hundred people. Yeah. yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and you know, listen, uh, the women were it was, it, it filled the void. Let's put it that way, yeah. right? And um, it gave you a sense. I remember, um, you know, I'd be at certain events and the crowd would just be going nuts and you could tell that's why, Oh, this is why people are addicted to celebrity. Like this is why anybody does anything like really ridiculous online. It's like, why would you embarrass yourself like that? Like, I know why once you taste that, that's like one of the biggest highs ever. Right. And if that's your thing. And I remember going, Ooh, I shouldn't don't love this. Don't love this. Don't love man. this, you know, because a lot of the guys got trapped there and stayed there until they were way later in life. And by then too late, by then too late. Right. So I toured all over and I did that for a lot of years. Meanwhile, going back to school, I actually became a personal trainer. Um, and I started learning again. Remember, I went to so many different types of healers when I had the OCD. Yeah. Right. Severely. 
I had learned so much now about nutrition and training. I was being kind of like a nutritionist of the Chippendales there for a while, this traveling group, um, which is like a, a, like a side group of Chippendales. There's not the ones in Vegas. Right. Um, and, uh, so, so, so now, um, and I'm obsessed with nutrition. Right. And, uh, so literally that's how I really got my start. And then because of that, I became known for personal training. So it was a way to segment me because people wanted to come train with me because of that. That makes sense. Right? So this is crazy how God uses everything, right? All ingredients are used in God's kitchen, right? Because I can't figure out how this life ends up to me developing a system that heals people all over the world. We're still not there yet. Right? So it's like, well, how does, where's the connection? Well, the connection is when you got, that many thousands of people screaming your name, you know, um, it's, uh, that's a very addictive thing. I remember, I remember, I remember one time we did it at an event. It was like Wisconsin, a center. And then the bar paid me there. There's a club in the center of the casino, um, paid me to come to that event afterward. And they rushed me in a way where I was like signing babies and cell phones and like what, like everything you could think of. And it was so bad. It was like, so it took hours that like they had to make a line to get me drinks like of bouncers from like the club over. And I'd never got that kind of reception. Nobody knew who I was because like I, this is, this is just as like Facebook's kicking off. It's not like you knew who I was, but at that moment, because I'm the one on stage, I look like the big deal. Right. But I'm right. really a nobody. Right. Right. But you think I'm a somebody. And so, and it just caught fire that night. And I remember being there in that moment and was like, I remember tasting that. And that was like, I got to get out. That was the thought I got out of that. I mean, I was so glad that I had that moment, but I was so like, if I stay here, I know, I know what addiction feels like. And I am already on and off battling this other issue. I was like, if I stay here, drugs, women, and that feeling, it's over for me. And I knew it. And so that's when I started making my plan of how I was going to get out. Cause you get sucked in, you know, you get sucked in and doing tours. And so then I went to part-time and so then I would go to the training, do all the training programs in gold's gym. And then I'd fly it on the weekends, go do an Alaska tour, go do a, you know, Puerto Rico, whatever. Fun places you wanted to go wherever you want to go. Right. right. And, and, um, uh, you know, <clears throat> I had to wean myself off of it. There wasn't like a cold turkey because that those that's that high is hard to let go. Oh, right. But I, I could see the end of the line and I could see that there was no way I was going to be able to cut my drug addiction and my alcohol and all my issues with me still in this life. And um, and so I, I built a very hefty nutrition career. I worked with a lot of reality TV stars out of Chicago and people got familiar with me because I was like the entertainer trainer. Right. Um, and now I'm starting to get a lot of people that also had real problems because I was so popular. Right. And, and I'm starting to realize that like people are coming in and now my background in addiction, my background in the, and the, uh, the OCD, my background in nutrition, my background of understanding training, my background of going to holistic healers. Now I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, these people are coming to problems like thinking that just training and losing weight's going to solve it. And they are so not right. And cause this is when the training, you know, world started to blow up and everybody started going to everything for a trainer. Everybody started, but it doesn't matter what you had. You were going to a trainer. It's like, ah, oh, my guts are messed up. My cholesterol is off. I got a huge belly. I don't feel good. And I need to get right for this wedding. Can you help me or whatever? You know, <clears throat> and, um, in the center that I, this place is at, there was also a chiropractor, Reiki, there was hormone specialist. They're just early one. This is, this is now 18 years ago, right? Okay. 18 years ago, nutrition starting to become important. Like they're talking about vitamin D and fish oil and like, you know, vitamin C and stuff like that more and more, po more popular. And, um, so I created this system where, I started really adapting in coaching, like health coaching, which did, they didn't have that name at the time. It was just like nutritional nutrition consultations along with your training, along with trying to get them into the Cairo and the hormone specialist. I created my own little system and it got really popular. Um, but remember on and off my clients put up with everything because I'd be great for three months and then I'd go on a bender for five days and you wouldn't see me. Right. And, and, um, and then one time 
I didn't come back to work for two and a half weeks. I got stuck in Vegas, uh, and I went on a bender, and um, I I saw hell on earth. Like I was, I've been up for so many days. I think um, I'm in Vegas. I think I'm up to day five. Day five, I'm still up, and uh, yeah, and uh, I'm going heavy on on cocaine, and this is when I started seeing things and it was like the under pit of Vegas rose up and all of these evil creatures rose from the fucking streets. And I saw them for real. Like when, when you hear a story of like some guy in like Nantucket or something that like takes a machine gun out to his palm tree. Cause he thinks he sees a goblin in it. That dude really thought he saw a goblin. And I can tell you, cause I saw this stuff. And if it weren't for my OCD, I would have believed that stuff was real too. Like, um, you know, the fire alarms in the, uh, like the smoke alarms, it came out and started spinning like a UFO and flying around the room. I'm sitting there looking at this. I'm like, all right, chances are that's not happening. (laughs) Now, if you, if you didn't have OCD and you've never had anything like that and that happens, you're going to freak out. Right. And then all of a sudden silhouettes of people and creatures started coming up from the ground. And there was a guy outside my door with a chainsaw. I mean, this is how crazy it got. And I'm, I've been doing so much drugs at this point that my nose is bleeding. And like, you know, I'm, I have an eight in four or five days and. Total delirium and everything. Yeah. 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 yeah, Insanity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm having to move hotel to hotel because I'm, I'm realizing that they are picking up on me being weird. And so I need to like move locations because of it. And I, I just remember that, you know, Mike Trotter, which he's with First Form, um, he's the PT boss. I remember he saw the talent in me and enough that he was willing to work through those moments and he didn't let me go. And I'm really grateful for that guy. He's a big part of why my career is today because he saw me, he knew I was dealing with stuff, but he's like, my clients didn't want to let me go. <laughs> you know, people would... I didn't realize that was the talent. I don't realize at the time that my ability to persuade people and my ability to motivate them to be their best was so valuable that they were willing to put up with my dark side because they loved me so much. Yeah. Now, listen, at the time I'm taking advantage of that. Okay. Cause I didn't understand at the time that that was a gift. Correct. I, I saw it as like something that got me in trouble, but it would get me by like, okay, I can get you to like, hang on. You know, when I would go through these moments and you'll put up with, X, Y, and Z, but I always hated myself for it. Hated myself for it. Cause growing up as a kid, my favorite heroes were He-Man and Ninja Turtles. And like, I was always the good cop in my own little world. And I was this, and now here I am on this guy that goes on the road, sleeps with a bunch of women, um, lets people down, um, really puts on a front. This is when I started doing steroids. So I'm looking bigger, but I'm not really living the life. Um, and I just remember looking in the mirror like, you're a fraud, right? You're a fraud. And um, there are some other things that happened at this time that I, I, didn't, I didn't talk about um, earlier, but that are pretty intense stuff. Um, but I think just to highlight it, um, to highlight it, uh, I felt I hated myself. I hated That's myself. The- Ultimate form of self-love. Me and Joe Adams talks about that. There comes a point in a man's life, you look at yourself, you say, I fucking hate you. Yeah. I, and you really mean yourself harm. Yeah. Like, yeah. you just know you're a dead man walking. Yeah, yeah go ahead, keep yeah. going. I remember looking in the mirror many different times when I was here calling off work again and not visiting, like, you know. Because it got bad. I mean, there were times where, right before I became a trainer, that it was a really bad moment where in between on tour, I ran out of all my money and I ended up living with this other gang member in this abandoned building for like six months with no money strung out. Um, and you're probably making good money doing that. Yeah. But I just blow through it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Typical stripper lifestyle. We joke about women having the men have too. Yeah. 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 I mean, I can make either, you know, easy 1500 a night. Damn. Right. No, good shows. You can make a little more average shows. You're making less than that. But yeah, 
Um, and then I'd have side jobs and, you know, this and that. I was always good at sales and I tried to start a couple of private businesses while I'm doing this. Like I, you know, there was time in between all this where I'm like trying to do a landscaping business and a drywall business. Those both fail. You know what I mean? We're just trying to handle anything to try to just get out. Yeah, to go yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot of mishandling of of opportunities there. You know what I mean? And every relationship that I have, I end up letting down. Every person that believes in me, I end up at one point letting them down. Right? But Mike wouldn't give up at the gym. Mike wouldn't give up, and there were a lot of people that wouldn't give up. You know, there's a lot of people along the journey that uh, today I know. You know, we're 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 there and like that is the on the behalf of God. You know what I mean? Whether they knew it or not. And, um, and so, uh, but that was a near death experience. I did so much drugs. I lost so much weight. Um, I ended up having to like, I went and put myself in the hospital for a day. Um, and, and I, I ended up going to a couple like rehab. Didn't stick, um, back out. It would for a while, you know, six months, eight months, you know? Um, and, uh, uh, this is when, right when I get the opportunity, though, remember, I'm still successful enough that it draws the ire of a global health and wellness organization called Metagenics. <clears throat> because I built such a big, like, nutrition system. And they were the owner of Metagenics Midwest, and they're, they're like a global functional medicine organization, right? And the, with some of the best doctors in the world training on these techniques and they developed the supplements and some of the protocols and the technologies and the systems, right? Um, I want you to think of Metagenics as more of a natural pharmaceutical company in that the way that it works is they will fund the research at Gig Harbor, Washington. They were bringing the doctors and the great minds, but it's being funded by supplement sales. Fair. So people don't realize that about Metagenics. It's way more that than it is just like a, some <coughs> supplement company. They're the glo- They're one of the global leaders in like research, product development, all of that for sure. In my opinion, like over time, they may have changed now some. That particularly when I'm, when I'm, when I'm getting with them, this was, uh, oh boy. So we're eleven years out. So this is sixteen years ago. So what's that? 2015, 20, that's a no, 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 twenty ten, two thousand ten, twenty ten. So um, so anyways, th- they recruit me. Um, and say, hey, you know, why don't you come work for us and, uh, and learn all these things that we have to t- show you? Because the owner ended up running my program. <clears throat> and I was like, okay. I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. I'm going to break out and try to get into, like, like think of it as medical sales. Um, and remember, again, you know, uh, I'm battling my own demons, but I'm obsessed with helping people. And I got good at it. Right. I got good at it. But that was at the time when training was just real high protein, killing them with cardio, five days in the gym, crushing them. Right. Right. Pretty straightforward. But I started adding in all these other things that I saw were problems because I'm just learning like how to expand to more tools. And it's not just about caloric deficits and high intensity training and, you know, different things like that. Right. And, and anyways, so, um, I get shipped off to California and I train under some amazing practitioners. Um, they have a whole training facility that was kind of out there in California. I got to meet Dr. Mark or, or Dr. Jeffrey Bland and I got to train under him a lot and some of his teachings. One of the books. Dude, I had no idea what I was about to get into. They showed me an entire world that I had no idea existed all the science on detoxification and hormones and how foods fight work synergistically in the phytonutrients and, and antioxidants and the blue zone sciences and like, and, and just uh, science and the cholesterol, cardiometabolic, about all of this from a holistic functional perspective. I didn't know it existed. It was like this whole new world, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. When you talked to me about it the first time, I was like, what? Yeah. I had no so, yeah. idea. It was like unlocked. I thought I knew everything and I knew 10%. Whole new I'm, world. A whole new world of possibilities. And um, this was about the time, uh, right when about the time when I had a really, I had a, I had a, I had a, I got a girlfriend that I'd met at a show. I moved her down from Wisconsin to live with me in Illinois. And um, she, uh, I had let her down so many times go off, wouldn't come back for days, you know, tell her I'd stop and then wouldn't. And one day, um, right before I took the job, right before I took the job, I was bringing back a car 
uh, that my grandfather gave me from uh, Ottawa. And I'm bringing the car back. And on the way, I stop and I pick some, some drugs up. And then I stop in Indianapolis. And in Indianapolis, I'm about, I'm, I'm getting high. I'm like, oh, I'm going to sneak off in my room. I'll do it for the night and then drive the rest of the way. Where the, there was this couple. There was this couple that was having a hard time getting in the room. Something was going on, whatever, whatever. And so I decide to go help them and drive them to another hotel that they can get in the room. Um, long story short, um, I end up getting held at gunpoint, um, and put held hostage in the back of my car for over 10 hours while, um, while they kept copying more crack and stopping at spots. And the, the, it was a really tall black dude. I mean, he must've been, I mean, it was, had to be like six, seven, a big guy. Um, and then his woman, which I'm assuming, uh, was his like, like, uh, what would you call him? His, his, his bottom, <laughs> his girl that he would, that would perform tricks and stuff, but also his girl, yeah. uh, I'm guessing is what that it was. Uh, and, uh, but what, yeah, they held me in the back of the car for 10 hours in this car that my grandfather just gave me. Yeah. And, um, I remember them getting a little too high, long story short, the, the, the sun's coming up. They had to go pick up all of her stuff got thrown out from the trailer that she was staying at. <laughs> These stories are wild. Like, that's, you know, but when you're in that kind of scene, you get wild. You stories. get wild. So this is just, yeah, I'm just no, giving you a couple, yeah. but this is the one that got me into I recovery. This one's the bars. I got some wild times. Yeah, yeah. This is the one. So he's, they go to pick up all of her trash bags that was out in this, uh, and I, at this point, we're getting to 10 hours, and I'm thinking to myself, how long can they hold me before they got to figure out what to do with me, right? Because they're going to get nervous at some point. Why did they take you? Because they needed the vehicle. Okay. They needed the vehicle to get around and then have me get money from ATMs and stuff like that. Um, but I was running out of money on the ATMs, and they had held me so long, they were going to have to figure out what to do with me. And I started thinking about that. And so they're picking up all the trash bags from the house that the trailer park that her over stuff got thrown out and the sun's coming up and we're driving and I'm starting to see people outside. Now, remember, I'm also coming down off of drugs. I'm fiending. Um, and I remember being so ashamed because I would have let them keep the car had they given me more cocaine in the back. Right. That's like where I was at in my life. Right. It was that bad. And he stopped because he dropped his crack pipe in the side of the door. So he stopped the car real fast. He didn't think. And he got out and he stuck his hands in the side of the, like, like uh, the seat. <clears throat> and I remember just letting go and saying, God, just take me. And I dove in. The, I said this, I've never said I'd be okay with death, but that was that moment. It was a growing moment for me. And I dove into the front seat and I wrestled this guy and we wrestled on the ground for I don't know how long. And, you know, a lady saw it, kind of screamed for help. And I was able to, again, you want to talk about being afraid. Afraid strength exists because there's no humanly reason. This guy was so much bigger than me that I should have been able to wrestle that gun away. And I did. And they took off. But the part that got me was when the cops showed up, they looked at me like I was the criminal because they couldn't tell the difference. And that's when I realized I'd become the bad guy of my own story. My whole life, I just wanted to be a hero. It was my mom's hero and like the save a hoe girlfriend hero and like the help clients hero. And I, I always wanted to be the good guy. And I'm not, I'm the bad guy of my own story. And I fucking hate me. And that was it. I said, I've had enough. And I went home and uh, first thing I was doing, I put myself in another rehab, this hospital rehab. And it was when I really was like, now I'm serious, right? Like I've got to do something because I cannot be this guy and I want to die, you know, and, and I need to do something. And that's when 12-step recovery was kind of reintroduced to me. I tried it a couple of times, dabbed in it, you know, be good for six months or a year and then back at it. It's almost like you're addicted to chaos. Yeah. Like, it almost sounds like when you were just born, it found you. I know. And you just made it your best possible soulmate yeah. and just had a story of weaving with it, like, yeah. a, like an intimate dance with it. Yeah. So you go through addiction recovery. Now, this point is sticks. Yeah. Well, 
when 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 right? the addiction recovery sticks, that's that's just the beginning. Okay. Because most people, um, when they finally are serious about it, they're still going to relapse a few times. Yeah. Like you don't have to relapse. I want to be very clear about recovery. Uh, addiction uh, recovery, or excuse me, relapse is never okay. Um, but it's a part of it, right? And um, that was when I started really getting serious. This is 27 years old. It still takes me another six years before I really get long sobriety time. Another six years. So I, by the time I finally got serious and I knew I needed it in my life to when I was really able to live a recovered life, um, still a long battle ahead. Right. There were still relapses in there and, and my near death experience, which we will get to, that was the one that was really the, the straw that like I had, the, I had the psychologic change and that's when everything else happens. So go off to metagenics. I learned, I ended up becoming a medical rep member. I'm still dancing on the weekends. So I'll fly out on the weekends, come back and be a medical rep. <laughs> so I'll go to walk in. I walk into, uh, I walk into like, uh, networks, medical networks, and talk, talk to the chief medical officer. You know, I'm talking about functional medicine protocols, and then I'm flying out to Puerto Rico to dance for 3,000. Dual lives, man. That was me. I was always living a double life. It's always like, living like a wrestler life. you see in the WWE biographies <laughs> where they talk about you have a hard time separating the two. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah, kind of yeah, wild. Yeah. yeah. And um, that is when, I'll tell you this, <clears throat> that's also, though, when I started meeting all these doctors and learning all of their protocols. And I became an advisor for these doctors and I got really good and none of them knew I was a Chippendale. Right. <laughs> and so they're calling me like, how do I work this patient? And I might be on the road to like, I don't know, Miami to do an event. <laughs> Text the doctor when I'm backstage, like, here's how you use the ashwagandha in these cases. Here's how you blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff, yeah. but obsessed. I'm on the tour bus, like reading, the functional medicine research and like then I get off and do do a show and get off you know fucked up and then and then come back to work and that job worked for that because I could I could hide if I still you know, went out too late and needed to start a half day on Mondays and stuff because right. I was just on the road all the time you know so um but uh I got really good at that and I started learning how everyone used different functional tools and I got to work with hundreds and hundreds of practitioners and I learned all the different skills and I, uh, everything I already learned and knew. And I started formulating this, this concept through pattern recognition of like what the best things were to put all together based on my nutrition that I already knew. So this is the formation occurring of my process that I'm gonna end up healing lots and lots and lots of people and making such an impact in the fitness and eventually the medical community, right? But we're focusing on the addiction part in then, so then I finally walk away. Um, I finally walk away um, from dancing. The girlfriend I have at the time leaves me. And that was, the, that was the time, that was the time that I was totally sober. This is why I knew addiction wasn't the drugs and it was me. I was totally sober. Girlfriend leaves me when I thought I was gonna get engaged or quit dancing for her. And I'm on my knees. Now I'm on a lot of wind straw at this time. And I'm on a lot of other steroids. I'm on my knees holding a knife to my neck. And I'm like, and I wanted to go to do it. And I couldn't do it. And when I couldn't do it, there was just this release of crying. I'm crying on the floor. I throw the knife. And the next week, so I decide not to kill myself. I get serious about going further into my recovery. The next week is when I technically opened up Nutrition Dynamic. The next week. And I did that in Waynesville, Ohio. You shouldn't know where that's at. Back of the chiropractic office. I borrowed a chiropractor's office in his desk. Dr. Jim Byers, amazing guy. We, th we threw a couple of events together and sold some contracts. And so I started with like four to eight clients in the back of a chiropractic office in Waynesville, Ohio, exactly 11 years ago. Um, and I went sober for a very long time and I lived the 12 steps and it radically changed me. Changed everything about my life, my beliefs. The 12 steps is one of the most powerful tools to radically change your life. They apply it today for CEOs. They do it for all kinds of things. Half the self-help books that you heard about, a piece of it is 12 steps. 12 steps when I got serious about it, I started actually moved over to Narcotics Anonymous and um, 
you know, when I really went sober for me. Sobriety was extremely important at the time. Um, and I was still an emotional wreck. I was still doing dopamine seeking things. I don't understand what addiction is still to this point. Uh, I just think it's like, it's, I thought it was the substances that I used. But then remember, when my girlfriend left me, I was more unmanageable than I'd ever been on the drugs. I'd never considered suicide on the drugs. Here I was, sober, more unmanageable than I'd ever been in my life, and I just wanted to end it. That scared the shit out of me because what I learned is I can't live with the drugs, and I can't live without the drugs. That's the scariest moment in any drug user's existence. That moment happens for all of us when we have a realization that it wasn't the drugs making us insane. We were insane. And that's scary because how do you get, how do you get rid of you? And that's when I ran as hard as I could to the 12 steps because I needed something. Uh, my life was on fire and I was just trying to pretend and keep it together on the surface. Meanwhile, this entire time, that's what's so crazy is that when you're going through the storms that can be the greatest gifts, because this is when I'm developing the technology that I'm going to use to heal so many people. Meanwhile, the only person I still really need to heal is me. Right. right? And the tools that I use today for some of the mental frameworks and the ways that I get people to believe they can do the thing that I'm asking them to do comes from the training manual of the 12 steps. Bill and Bob were developing a 12-step technology that came from the Oxford group that came before them in the 1980s to 1920s. Don't quote me on exact dates. Oxford group fell apart because they got into politics. So there's a story where um, Bill meets this guy from the Oxford group who tells him about this new way of life and that he found God. And Bill's in there drunk again. His life, his wife's about to leave him. He's lost everything. He's lost all of his money. And then he's looking at him and he goes, Oh God. So his life is totally in shambles. But then when his friend that he hadn't seen in years, who looks amazing, brings up God, he's like, there's levels and you're the worst. Like you think my life's bad. You just brought up God, right? Like that's where he was at, you know? And for me, the 12 steps is a, is a how to dummy manual for spirituality because it, 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 I found I, you know, I grew up in the Catholic church, but then when my parents got separated and, um, That's why I get it. Um, I had, a, I had a really negative connotation of God. Uh, I felt that God was a supreme ruler that was only there to discipline you. And that once you messed up, you were cast out and that was the end of it. Yeah. That was the gist of what I got from Catholicism. I'm not saying that's what they're about, but for me, that's what I got. I didn't get a loving father that was actually in it with me through all the trenches and all the things I didn't, I didn't, that wasn't the God I understood. I knew the God of wrath and judgment and I wasn't down with that. So there was a part where I believed in him, but I was apart from him for me. Right. And, uh, so I started the journey of the 12 steps and it was very hard going sober because you realize that what you're really addicted to is dopamine. And, you know, when you remove the cocaine, um, you're going to fill it with other things when you fully don't understand. So now it's more steroids, bodybuilding, women, working, right? All the ancillary things. Hey, at least those things won't kill me tomorrow. So it's a step in the right direction. So for anybody who's listening to this, it's like if you've given up the drugs and you still have problems in your life, you're still on the way. And that's okay, right? Like I would still like... Damn good message. Yeah, like I literally was on the way, but I still had criminal tendencies, like I would still lie to people, steal from people. And I wouldn't steal too much, but you know, I might grab, I don't know, I might not tell you if like, uh, you know, I, I, I grabbed a hundred to borrow from me. I forgot to tell you later, you know, something like that. There still might be periods of my life where I might do stuff like that back then. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, so, so here I am trying to follow and get better, but I still have my character defects and that's not evidence that I'm not getting better. That's just part of the process of evolving out of the things that are, that are holding you back. Um, and I still just, the people in the 12 steps kept loving me, even though I couldn't fucking get it. I wouldn't surrender enough just to follow all the simple steps and, and show up to all the meetings and do all the little steps and 
pray in the mornings and call my sponsor. I was unwilling to follow it exactly the way that they wanted. So every time I started doing the steps, my life would take off. And then I get into the things that made me socially acceptable. I get back into like success, money, women. And then guess what? I'd relapse again. I'm like, fuck, how are we here again? But those people in those rooms, they taught me what unconditional was because I showed back up with my tail between my legs and every single time they had a smile and a hug and we love you, keep coming back, you're gonna get this thing. And uh, I'll never forget that. And I did, I, I must have relapsed 50 times. And I'd come back and I wouldn't quit because I knew without it, I was fucked. But I couldn't live with it either. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't surrender enough just to follow the way that you wanted me to do it, you know? But because I had good periods of abstinence in there, my life started taking off, right? Like the 12 steps works. Like you want to find a way to make a lot of money and have a great life? I don't even care if you're an addict. Follow the 12 steps. It's the how-to manual for success. I try to tell people that today. <laughs> you, you want your like, you want to go to like a, um, a mindset pr program where you get free therapy and you get steps to be successful for free? <laughs> it's the 12 steps, man. Yeah, I've heard that actually said before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I use it to teach my business mentees and they take off. Right. It's, it's an amazing tool. And whether you agree that God is, I don't care um, who you call God necessarily, as long as you ain't it. First rule of God is you ain't it. So I don't care what you call them, but you do got to call them though. There needs to be a power greater than you, whether that's a collective consciousness of the community, the universe, eventually that should hopefully manifest into a particular identity of what your God is like because it's important, it's important to identify what your God was like. Because I thought my God was this, when it was, when it was Catholic God, it was like this um, ob obedient driven God, a punisher, um, not connected to his children, not in love. And I developed the formation of the God that I know today, which has been following me and had my back this entire time. And that was laying the tracks before me and was letting me go through the entire rite of passage to become the man that I was going to be, right? And now that narrative, you are what you believe and it's an identity and you get to choose what that is. And I, ch and when I chose to understand that there was a God that was laying the tracks before me, I started acting different instead of the God that was here to punish me. And those actions led to changes in my life that brought abundance beyond my wildest imagination. So whether it's real or not, I don't care. It works. That's the point. I don't want to debate how God interacts with you and if there's actually a heaven in the way that it is. All I'm saying is that if you follow these ways and you find one and you develop the characteristics you believe that they have, a God of your understanding, it can do crazy and abundant things for you. I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that. Right? You know, wherever you sit on the spectrum. And so that's what 12 Steps does. It doesn't dictate the terms of your, it's not a religion. So you basically now have kind of like fully reborn. Like you're, you're on the other side. You're, you're. I wish Jeff, it was that clean. And that's why my story I think is one of the best is that on the journey, you think that you're going to get to a place of sainthood almost like you expect yourself to get up to a place where you stop hating what you see. Yeah. Yeah. And you think you're going to get to a place where you're perfect. Yeah. And what happened along the way was I would still, there were still challenges um, in my imperfections, in my personal relationships, they call them character defects. I still was having a hard time being faithful to a woman. Uh, I was still having a hard time uh, not letting bodybuilding and the steroids be my identity, you know, and, and uh, not lying. You know, I got so good at lying that it was easier to lie than to tell the truth. Because you're living a double life. You have, to, you have to lie to everybody for what you think is their benefit. So it's like, even if I went to the gas station, I might just tell you I stopped at Walgreens because it's just easier to lie. Undoing that, even though inside you know you want to be good, undoing those habits can take a long time and those habits can lead to mistakes even on the journey. And so what happened was I developed the 4F process, which I believe today is the greatest healing technology that's ever been created based on all of the nutrition, holistic, you know, functional medicine, and even allopathic, you know, standard Western medicine. I tied it all together into a process. 
that process, that formula starts changing lives. I'm not ready for it, right? We go from the back of that chiropractic office to one of the largest one-on-one functional health organizations, fitness organizations in the United States, like that. Matter of like, granted it was a grind, but five years. Year five, year five, what's funny is I told you about all the times that I almost died. Well, I did drugs so heavily. Uh, I did all the things. I was with all the bad people. The time that almost killed me is because I couldn't handle the scale of my business. I started blowing up and I didn't know how to deal with abundance. And that abundance made me so afraid because now I got a waiting list. People were trying to work with me. All of this thing, everything I thought I wanted and I feel so under the weight of it and the identity of it and trying to live up to this thing that I fuck up and I go back into Adderall. I had an old prescription for Adderall. I started taking it. It triggered the addiction and then I started to get back into cocaine again. And I'm doing it while I'm working. I'm not even doing it to go party and get away. I'm doing it to perform. Yeah, that's when it's dangerous. Yeah, I think that I got to get an edge because everyone needs me. And to a certain degree, I was the only one with the technology. Like I blew this thing up. Everyone's coming to me. I had no one else to send them to. I mean, I know you've kind of been watching from the outside, but you've kind of seen how fast it's kind of escalated. Yeah. I'm not ready for that emotionally. And then you never, you never think that you're a good enough person to deserve it. I agree with everything you're saying. And so I still feel like the fraud, even though I've been putting in the work and God's been showing me for how many years. And I know the intentions in there because the kid that's inside is still the eight-year-old boy that knows what it's like when no one believes you. To know what it's like to look at a world and not sure, to be hopeless and and, and for, for nobody to understand you and then for you to question if this is what your existence is going to be like. I know what that feels like. I don't want everyone, anyone to ever feel like that ever. I wouldn't wor- wish that on my worst enemy. And I know that. And in the functional space, everyone's coming to me that feels just like that. They told 17 doctors have told them they're crazy or insane or go home or reduce your calories and just work out more. All the things. And I know that that's not true. I know that the first thing that you're, it's your fucking job as a practitioner or a guide is that when someone tells you something, you fucking believe them. Because it, on the off chance that they're telling you the truth. Now you can through elimination or deductive process figure out some people, maybe they are crazy and some people, maybe they misunderstood, but there's a good amount of those people that tell you they're sick and there's something wrong. And when you just cast all of those out and just assume that they're all crazy or just assume that there's, there's something that they're missing, you're going to get it wrong. And that even if you do that to one person, that's one person too many because that person's going to suffer and they're going to think it's them. It was the same thing for the addiction for a really long time. I thought I was just a, I just thought I was morally corrupted. I thought it was a me issue. I didn't know I had a disease. I didn't figure out I have a disease until I'm like 28 years old and someone in recovery tells me, you're not a bad person. You're you're dealing with an illness. If if somebody came up to you and, and was like, judged you for shaking and having the shigavers and having the sweats, right? If they judged you for that, right? But you had a cold, you'd go, well, I have a cold. That's why I'm acting like this. I have a cold. Obviously, it's why I act like this, right? Or if someone came and judged you because you had cancer, like, look at you laying down, feeling all sick. You know what I mean? And you would be like, bro, of course I am. I've got cancer. Well, addiction's hidden where it's like, I've got, I'm lying, I'm cheating, I'm stealing. Um, I, 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 my behavior's off. Someone looks at you and goes, you're just a piece of shit. Well, no, I have a disease, just like cancer, and it's called addiction, and it's got me. And the symptoms of addiction are lying, cheating, stealing, doing, def- doing things to try to hide the truth, right? That's the symptoms of it. But I don't know that because no one tells me it's a disease, so I just think I'm a bad person. And it's the same thing with all these cases of these people out here in the world that they just tell them they're crazy or just tell them it's... Uh, uh, obsessive compulsive like behavior or just tell them it's because they're not eating right or just tells them that they're lying or just tells them whatever. So many people and, and more and more growing every single day of what we'll call the medical gray and the people falling through the cracks of the medical system and they, they think it's them. 
And so that happens to me and I feel ultimately responsible for it. I start tapping into the drugs again. The problem is they started giving me bad drugs. There was crystal meth in my cocaine or crystal uh, meth. I'd never done meth before. And in meth, time goes really, really like, I don't know if you've ever done medicinal, you have, but medicinal, we'll say medicinal mushrooms. Time goes really wow. slow. Oh God. Time goes really punishingly slow. Punishingly slow. It goes really slow. But on meth, That's the lesson. on meth, things go really fast. Yeah. And so seven days had gone by, I, I hadn't eaten anything. I lost 47 pounds in seven days. My kidney started to fail. And the doctor said if I had gone one more day, I'd been dead. And I remember me falling over and my heart's feeling like it's, it's gonna go. Because it, it, it's been going so hard, I'm like, I, like I'm certain I'm dying. And I, and I was close. I mean, the doctors were sure of it. There was a little damage to my heart and everything like that. Like the doctors were, I was there. And I remember this is the, my, what I call my ayahuasca moment. Because if anybody's ever done ayahuasca before, I, I don't need it. I got the near death experience. So I think I've had the abbreviated version. I, I don't need to. I DMT. It's not the same thing, but I've, I've played with DMT. Yes. The idea of controls taken from you. You have no control of your body. And you're laying there and you're reviewing your life. That's, that's what's happening. And it was showing me all the things that I hadn't done, all the medicine that I hadn't done, all the lives I hadn't healed, all the things that I could have atoned for, all the great things I was about to do that I never did. And here's the leader of this health organization that's about to die from a drug overdose. And he's never going to be able to tell his story. And he's never going to be able to tell his mom how much he loves her. And she's never going to be able to do all the things to make his father proud and show him that, like, this is the man that you actually raised, not that derelict teenage boy um, who did criminal actions, right? And I sat in that moment and I said, God, if you get me out of this, I'm going to use this moment. I'm going to get up and I'm going to change the world and I'm going to tell him it was you. And that moment happened. And then that moment when I came out of it, when I woke up out of it, because I ended up passing out, when I woke up out of it, um, that's when my, my brother at the time, Mo, and Mercer, who now works for me, showed up at my house and go, have you looked at you? And I looked at myself in the mirror and I go, I didn't notice the guy. I lost so much weight in seven, I lost so much weight in seven days that my shoulder fell out of socket, my back went out of place, I had to get in a sling, because I was on a bunch of steroids and all the stuff and then I didn't eat anything for seven days. I, I, so fast and they were like bro what are you gonna do I'm like that's it full surrender I took a picture of myself right then I took a picture of myself and that and how gaunt and just terrible I looked and Save I said that for the book <clears throat> yeah I bet he does I no, used it on stage I used it on stage in the first hybrid health summit because right. I told the story there about the addiction but I but that was what I'm telling you now is here's the decision I took that picture and I remember the visions, but I, I feel in my heart that I was supposed to do something bigger. I was meant for something more. I'm gonna, I was like, I'm gonna use this photo when I get up and I, and I fucking kick this thing's ass and I, and I leave an impact on the world, I'm gonna use this photo as fucking proof. And I'm gonna tell them it was you. I went out to California and I went to one of those deep spiritual recovery programs, some amazing people out there, Huntington Beach, California. Shout out Huntington, some of the great people that live in that community. Um, I went out there and I got serious and I surrendered all my businesses. I surrendered almost all my clients and I trusted that everyone else could run it. And I really got serious and I went through the most spiritual transformative experience that I think a, per a person can go through. I came out of there a different person and I stayed there for I think three and a half, almost four months. And every vision that I'd had about businesses and what I wanted to do, I drew out and I came back and I built all of that in one year and I tripled my net worth in that year from all of those visions that I had of being out there at that, at that recovery center. And I attributed all to the recovery and the 12 steps. I would too, if I were you, right. sounds like that was a powerful moment for you. It was dude. This has been like the most transparent, like as your friend, I have like the most utmost respect for you for sharing all this with yeah. us. And this story, I, I, I want to say one thing that I've I've admired by hearing you. It, it's like the Rocky with addiction is what I really feel like he's painted. You just got to stand back up. 
one more time. And if you didn't stand back up one more time somewhere, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Every time that you get back up, the one thing that you got that you didn't have is hope. Yep. And that's the thing you got to hang on to no matter what. No matter how bad it gets. If you get up one more time, you got one more shot. And one more shot is more than you just had before you took the decision not to take your life or you wake up in the morning. One more shot is more than what you just had. And that's all I had. And so I just kept getting up and kept getting up and kept getting up. And I failed at recovery more times than probably anybody has ever in the history of recovery. And because I did that, because I didn't quit, eventually the miracle happened. And, and now today, we got a you know, huge health network, staff of a, uh, over 120, healing people globally, supplement companies, the nutritional systems, I've got my own medical company now, all of those things with partners that are absolutely amazing. And I run my own emotional addiction anonymous program. It's got over a hundred members. It's nonprofit. Um, and I, work, and I so desperately want to find every person that's an addict and I want them to realize that you, you are a secret hero. You're a hidden hero. You are unlimited because once you straighten out and you know how to train the addict mind, you could take the addict that's in the back of a Denny's Donuts is trying to get one more and has figured out who, how to survive like that for 10 years. You take that tenacity and you stick it into a field of serving others, look the fuck out. Because that motherfucker is the most powerful being on earth when he is able to get his addiction in alignment with service. And so that's why I come back to the original um, moral of the story. The things that happen to us are not happening to us. They're happening for us. And even if it doesn't feel it right now, whatever you're going through on at home or wherever you're listening to this podcast or watching this podcast, whatever you're, you're, is happening to you right now is forming you. It is transforming you. It is changing you. Pain is a requirement of growth. You can't go to the gym without it to hurt to grow your muscles. You can't form the person that you're supposed to be without the pain of the moments that you're going through. And if you choose to believe that as an identity and a narrative, then you will form into the person that you always dreamed you wanted to be. And that's what you're seeing. Someone who made a choice about who I wanted to be and allowed those moments to be the reason that I am and not the reason that I'm not. Fuck. I want to close it there. That's it. That's it. That's yeah. it. Damn. Guys, I hope this resonated with you. I feel... You know, as you guys seen over the After Dark series with Danny talking about seeing war to our conversation about poor and wrecking men today to Quentin sharing the the loss of that to Vince coming on here and bravely talking about addiction and just the whole the fucking having that dog in you. You just got that dog. You know, I think today I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna I'm gonna say my my, my thought to it. We're trying to suppress men and beat the fight out of them. And if it feels wrong to you, that's okay. Cause it feels wrong to me and I fucking fight back. And Vince has a story of fighting back too. Sometimes, you know, the world needs peacemakers. And other times and these people just go out there and fuck things up. And I've always respected Vince because I've, I told him long ago, I've always viewed him as a disruptor. And his life is one where you could definitely say that he was, he realized he was disruption with himself and he fixed it. And look at how many lives you help now, dude. I'm so proud of you as your friend. Thanks for coming up here from Tampa right. to join us here in the Nashville. Right. Um, all, dude. All we think about is liberation. How do we, how do we set free? Or, or, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's say it this way. We think about liberation. It's how do we get people to liberate them from the things that are holding them back, right? And I am, I am not afraid to get in the dirt because I almost lost everything, right? So for me right? All of whatever could come my way by trying to help others. I've already seen worse. So like for me, I'm not going to stop and uh, the world better look out. Cause I, I'm, I'm not afraid because I've already faced the worst things in my, in my, in my opinion. And so I'm, I'm willing to go forward in it in the face of it all, you know? That's right. Thanks. That's right. Fuck yeah. Uh, Keep kicking right, that awesome, ass, man. man. Yeah. Um, guys, sure to like share. If you guys, this was a pack full share it to one man out there. Um, my next one I'm going to do is probably going to shock you guys. But Vince, thanks for coming. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Ciao. Yeah, brother.